Hopefully you know that for the last several weeks and for the next foreseeable future, we'll be talking about prayer and specifically from the book of Luke and Acts, both the writings of Luke and they encompass a huge percentage of the New Testament. And we're emphasizing prayer from these books because a special emphasis of Luke is the prayer life of Jesus and of the early church that is emphasized in Luke even more so than in the other stories of Jesus' life. That being said, we introduced back in early January a strategy for us for prayer individually in our own lives and our homes, the Lighthouse Prayer Strategy. I hope all of you are employing that. If you need to know the details of what that looks like, you can go to the, to the website, bragonjesus.org, backslash, I can't remember, is Keith an earshot? It's either prayer or lighthouse. I can't remember which. But it's on there. Bless. Oh, it's in, it's in neither one. <laughs> There's Chris. You would know. Uh, thank you, Chris. I didn't see you sitting there. But yeah, backslash, and it'll give you all the details on that strategy. But we're wanting to pray for five friends, associates, or neighbors that we know who are not churched, that we want God to bless them. We want to pray five minutes a day, five days a week for five unchurched friends and neighbors. We want to pray that God would bless their body, that they would recognize that God is their creator and their sustainer. We want to pray that God would bless, bless their labor, that God would provide for them the needs that they uh, are required to live in this world, the material needs, and recognize God is their supply. We want to pray for God to bless them emotionally that they would have the peace of God which passes all understanding, that peace that only comes from Christ. We want to pray that God would bless them socially. And the fourth day, we want to pray for their relationships. We want to pray for relationships built on the love of God in their lives. And the fifth day, we want to pray for them spiritually. We want to pray for them to have a vital relationship with the God who made them, that they might have eternal life. And all I'm asking you to do is pray. So what are you talking about? My wife and I, several years ago, were in Thailand. We're in Bangkok, massive city. I think they've counted 10 or 11 million people, but there are probably 10 or 11 million more that haven't been counted. I've never seen such a place in my life with people everywhere. 99% of people in Thailand do not follow Jesus Christ. 1% of people are identified as Christ followers in the nation of Thailand. And this couple were planting a church in one of the neighborhoods in Bangkok. Hundreds of thousands of people, no church, no identifiable believers. And they rented an apartment there. And I asked them, I said, what's your strategy? He said, our strategy is simple, lean on God. What they did, they went and three months, all they did was pray. They met with a couple of other believers in their apartment and regularly on a daily basis they prayed. And they prayed until God started to move. And God obviously began to work in the people around them in that neighborhood. And when God started moving, they moved with Him. And that's the same is true for you. As you pray for those people around you, just, just commit to pray. And start seeing the doors that God will start to open. Start seeing the work and the power of God in the people's lives around you. And as God starts to move, you move with Him. You don't have to kick the door down. Let God open it through prayer. God will change the world through God's people if we're faithful to pray. Prayer touches every aspect of our lives with Christ. Well, let me use an illustration to demonstrate that. And to introduce what we're going to talk about today with regard to prayer. How many of us have ever been to the doctor? You go to the doctor and... Usually you go to the doctor when you're sick or feel bad. And what's the doctor do? The doctor asks you some questions and starts to examine you and, and <clears throat> usually tries to analyze your symptoms. You know, it's like, well, my leg hurts. Okay, well, let's look at your leg. Now, I may find out there's nothing wrong with your leg. It may be somewhere else making your leg hurt, but that's a good place to start is the leg. I'm always reminded when I think of this, you remember, remember the old television show Hee Haw from years ago? And then Archie Campbell played a doctor on there. And the guy, people would come to him and say, Doc, it hurts when I do this. He said, well, stop doing it. <laughs> That's a great diagnosis. But the doctor will look at your symptoms, and he'll analyze, 
whatever is revealed uh, through the diagnosis and try to analyze what's going on and determine what the malady is and treat it accordingly. I remember a, an old country doctor uh, that I knew of many years ago, and <clears throat> he had actually started his practice in the late 1800s. And he talked about in those pre-specialist days, pre-machinery um, to analyze and diagnose without uh, the aid of the technical advantages we have today, he said, you know, the easiest patients that he found to diagnose were infants. He said, because when I visit adults and I try to figure out what's wrong with them, they're always talking and telling me what they think's wrong with them, and it gets in the way of me figuring out what's really wrong with them. He said, what I've discovered is when I work on infants, it's much easier because you can just watch a baby, and you'll, you can figure out what's wrong. They'll tell you by the way they act. He said, much easier to diagnose. They just look at symptoms and look for signs to reveal what the problem is and then make a diagnosis. You know, the same is true for pastors. It's my job to diagnose the spiritual condition of the church and treat it accordingly. And I'm constantly processing intuitively what I observe. Everything about you is always going through a grid in me to assess what that says about spiritual maturity or lack thereof. And then my job is to respond accordingly in ministry to address that. I, I watch everything. I even watch where people sit at fellowship dinners and assess through that issues if they need to be assessed. Why? That's my job. As a parent, it's my job to assess my children as they were growing up. To assess them. To figure out where are they. Because my job is to turn them into and be God's instruments of helping the Holy Spirit turn them into productive, Christ-following, productive citizens. That's my responsibility. And it's my job to assess and diagnose what's revealed by behavior and signs, and respond accordingly. So what we look for in terms of diagnosing and assessing is revealed, I believe, most dramatically in our own lives through prayer. I think prayer is one of the most powerful spiritual barometers that exists. One of the most powerful spiritual barometers that exists. Now, in general, in general, what does prayer reveal? What does prayer reveal in general? Well, we've asked this question before. It bears repeating. When are you the most prayerful? When are you the most energetically engaged in prayer? When do you not have to be encouraged to pray? but you just spontaneously pray. I'll tell you exactly when it is. When you're in a bind. When things don't go the way you want them to go. When life is out of your control, that's when you are motivated to pray. You see, I believe that prayer reveals, true prayer reveals dependence upon God. True prayer reveals dependence upon God. Because when somebody looks up and yells, help, when do they do that? They do it when they recognize they can't do it on their own. And prayer is a recognition that we cannot do it on our own. True prayer is a recognition that we are here at somebody else's pleasure. And that we are dependent creatures. And we are not the author of our own destiny. Prayer is an expression of that. True prayer. The sad part is, so many of us don't realize that we are always dependent upon God. Listen, I don't care how smart we are. I don't care how much money we have. I don't care how strong we are. I don't care how popular we are. I don't care how much authority or position we have. None of us can guarantee tomorrow. None of us have the power to guarantee 
that we're going to be in this life alive tomorrow. Any one of us could be facing eternity by the end of this day. We live in constant dependence upon God. That's one of the greatest revelations and greatest truths to discover in life to humble us and keep us where we need to be is that every day we're dependent upon God. Now, let's think about Jesus. What does prayer reveal about Jesus? Well, to answer that question, we're going to go to Luke. And we're going to look at several passages in Luke. Let's see if we can turn there, beginning in chapter 4. We've been talking for the last few weeks about Jesus, and we began talking about His temptation in the wilderness when Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness and fasted. Now, it's interesting. Luke does not tell us that in those 40 days that Jesus prayed. But I would be willing to say that we can be confident, based on an analysis of Jesus' life, that in 40 days in the wilderness of fasting, that Jesus spent plenty of time in prayer. In fact, one could make a case he spent the whole time in prayer. And then we see how he, last week we saw how he came from the wilderness in the power of the Spirit as he began ministry. Now, look in chapter 4 and look in verse 42. Jesus was doing great ministry with lots of people. And it says, Now when it was day, he departed and went to a deserted place, and the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. Went to a deserted place intentionally to get alone. Notice in chapter 5, verse 16, the multitudes were pressing around him, wanting healing. But it says that he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Notice he says often, often withdrew. Jesus often. This was a pattern, a habitual pattern of life to get away into the wilderness and pray. And listen to chapter 6, verse 12. Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Isn't that amazing? Jesus prayed all night long. He didn't sleep. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. And from them he chose twelve whom he named apostles. Jesus had, we don't know how many disciples. We know he had at least five hundred because there were 500 of them that saw him after the resurrection. But from however many disciples he had, he chose 12 whom he named apostles. But more specifically, before choosing them, that was such an important choice that he spent the whole night in conversation with God the Father before making that selection the next day. And then, chapter 9, verse 18. Chapter 9, verse 18. The Bible says, And it happened as he was alone praying. Are you noticing a pattern here in Jesus' life? As he was alone praying that his disciples joined him, and he asked them, saying, Who do the crowd say that I am? Now this is Luke's rendering of that famous incident where Jesus uh, was with his disciples, and Peter made his famous Declaration of faith. You are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Luke tells us that that whole incident was instigated as a result of Jesus on another one of his private prayer retreats. As he was alone praying, his question to the disciples that led to that great profession by Peter was the result. And then in chapter 9, verse 28, now it came to pass, about eight days after these sayings, he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. If you read the rest of the chapter, you'll discover that this is the incident called the transfiguration. When Jesus was transformed and glorified visibly before them, and Moses and Elijah appeared to Jesus, and they discussed the crucifixion of Jesus between the three of them as Moses and Elijah came from heaven. And notice that this whole incident was in the context of Jesus getting a couple of his key disciples and getting away to get alone to pray. 
And then in chapter 10, in chapter 10, in chapter 10, verse 18, we have an incident recorded that Jesus had sent 70 of His disciples out on a mission. They came back thrilled because even the demons were subject to them as they had power over them. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. Notice this incident after the disciples reported back from a successful ministry trip to Jesus, and Jesus shared with them, the Bible says He rejoiced in the Spirit. That's the only time in the entire New Testament that it says that Jesus rejoiced. The only time. And notice what gave Him joy was their successful ministry. Now, in addition to that, notice Jesus' spontaneous response was to pray. You know, when something bad happens to you, what is your spontaneous response? Many times it's to pray, isn't it? And if you're like me, you take it a step further. It's not only you pray, but why did you let this happen to me, God? We not only pray, we blame Him for it. How many of us have an equally spontaneous response when something good happens? Notice that when Jesus rejoiced, His instinctive reaction was to go to the Father in prayer and praise. Wow. What does that say about Jesus and His heart and His priorities? Now, look at chapter 11, verse 1. Chapter 11... Verse 1, now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, another one of these times when Jesus intentionally gets away for prayer, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. Notice that it was out of Jesus' prayer life that the disciples approached him and asked to learn to pray based on what they had seen in him. Prayer was such... A prevalent part of Jesus' life, it saturated his life to the degree that the disciples wanted him to teach them to do the same. And in Luke, we have the teaching here of the model prayer, the prayer Jesus taught his disciples, the Lord's Prayer, as it's commonly called. But notice the pattern we see here in these few chapters in Luke. Notice the pattern of Jesus' life. Jesus' life was saturated with prayer. Not only was He praying while He did things, He took time to devote time alone and intentionally got away from people so He could be alone with the Father in prayer. Jesus' life was full of prayer. What do we learn from this? First of all, I think we learn that Jesus really became a man. He really was human. Why do we say that? Well... Prayer is an expression of dependence. Listen, Jesus didn't take any advantage over you and me in this life. You see, we neglect the clear teaching of Scripture, Philippians chapter 2, in what theologians call the kenosis passage because of a Greek word that means empty. The Bible says that even though He was God, He did not consider equality with God as something to be used for His own advantage. But He laid aside His divine privileges. He emptied Himself of His prerogatives, of, uh, prerogatives as God and walked as a human. And He resisted temptation to sin with the same power that He can give you and me to resist temptation. And he had to live every day in dependence on God the Father just as we do. He lived by the power of prayer. It proved he really became a man. 
He lived in total dependence on God the Father every day. You see, Jesus, you'll remember in the garden, as He prayed with His disciples and they came to arrest Him, one of His disciples took out a sword to defend them. And Jesus said, put away your sword. Don't you know that I can call more than 12 legions of angels right now? In other words, I'm laying aside. I am who I am. They know me. They're available at my beck and call. But I am not going to take advantage of being God. I am limiting myself to be man so that I can adequately do the work that the Father sent me to do to rescue and redeem other people. So prayer proves that Jesus didn't take any advantage over us as He walked this earth. Secondly, what else does prayer prove? It proves Jesus' prayer reveals that He did everything by faith because He prayed about everything. I hope you're seeing that as we read through these examples in Scripture, that Jesus prayed about everything. Jesus' prayer life Jesus' prayer life was conspicuous in everything He did. His disciples noticed it. Jesus' life was saturated by prayer. And He did everything by faith because He prayed about everything. You see, prayer, true prayer, is an expression of trust in God. Right? The promises of God lead us to pray. Jesus walked by faith more than anybody who ever lived. And His prayer life proves it. You see, to not pray is to not trust God. To not pray is to not trust God. When are your prayers the most comforting? When are your prayers the most effective in encouraging even yourself? It's when you pray with confidence. Is it not? It's when you have a particular promise from God that you claim. That you can stand on. That's when prayer is the most blessing. You see, effective prayer and faith are inseparable. And Jesus walked by faith more than any man who ever lived. And His prayer life proves it. Now, Jesus' life was saturated by prayer when He was on this earth. Listen to these words in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7. Listen to these words about Jesus' life now. The Bible says, Therefore, He is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him, since He always lives to make intercession for them. The primary of Jesus today is still the ministry of prayer. As He is sitting beside God the Father right now waiting to intercede for you as you call on Him. Waiting to intercede for you. As you call on Jesus, as you cry out to Him, as your sin bearer, <coughs> as your Savior, as your deliverer, then the Lord Jesus on your behalf goes to God the Father as you pray to Him. That's what it means to pray in Jesus' name. That's what he was talking about when he said, praying in my name, is to join with him in his intercessory work at the throne of God. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that Jesus' prayers are effective? Believe God the Father hears Jesus' prayers? Right now, he ever lives to pray for you. Wow. Wow. You see, when we think about Jesus and we think about His ministry, we usually think of miracles and healings and all kinds of, of dramatic things that are certainly legitimate. I wouldn't in any way say that that was not significant. But I would propose to you this morning that the most significant ministry of Jesus, the preeminent ministry of Jesus, was the ministry of prayer. More than anything, Jesus prayed. And it was because he prayed that he was able to save the world. 
If prayer was important to Jesus, finish the sentence. You know where I'm headed. Think about it. If prayer was important to Jesus, the sinless one, where does it rank in our order of priorities and importance? How important is it to us? Let me give you a clue if you haven't learned it yet. You cannot make it on your own. <laughs> you cannot make it on your own. It's through prayer that you make it with Christ. And it's the great gift that He has given us. You see, Jesus' ministry was primarily, and the most significant aspect of His ministry was prayer. That's the reason He could say this amazing promise in John 14, 12 and 13. Let's read this together. John 14, 12 and 13. Let's read this together out loud. Very truly, I tell you, Whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now this is an amazing promise. What is Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying that we will be able to do not only what He did, but greater things than He did. Most people choke on this promise and basically try to explain it away. Because most of us look at this promise and go, wait a minute, I don't, I don't think I'm in this category. We miss the point. The whole context of this promise is prayer. Let's look at it closely. First of all, he starts out very truly. In the original, what that is is the word, amen, amen. He says amen twice. Whenever Jesus wants people to pay attention, he starts out his message with amen, amen. That means hush, listen. Pay attention. Because I'm going to tell you something that you can really lean on here. He wants us to believe this. And he says, whoever believes in me. First of all, the key is faith in him. It's not us. Do you see that? It's faith in Him. It's not us. It's confidence in His ability. He says, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. Why? Because. That because tells us why. I am going to the Father. Who's at the right hand of the Father right now interceding for us? Jesus is saying, because I'm going to the Father, if you trust me, I'm going to be there to bring your needs to God the Father and God the Father will listen to Jesus. Furthermore, he says, and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You see, it's all about prayer. You see, what he's saying is these greater works will be done because his ministry of intercession continues. We join in that ministry and it's through the power of believing prayer that he will do more than we could ask or imagine according to His power that is at work within us. I want to tell you today that I believe that the God who promised through the prayers of His people is a powerful combination that is unstoppable. I believe that believing prayer in Jesus' name is as omnipotent as the God who ordained it. Hallelujah. Well, prayer of Jesus reveals that he was a powerful man of prayer, and that's the reason he was powerfully used of God. So what does prayer reveal about us? You see, I believe it reveals how much we really do depend on God. You see, either the frequency or the consistency of our prayers, or lack thereof, or the content of our prayers reveal what do we really believe. How many of you know that praying is the hardest thing for you to do as a Christian on a normal basis? How many of you know that? How many of you have good intentions to pray and you start to pray? As soon as you start to pray, your mind starts wandering. You start daydreaming. 
You know, you start going all over. How many of us know that? Except when we're really in a bind. Then we can kind of be focused till the problem wears off. But listen to what Luke says and the story he tells about Jesus in Luke chapter 18. As Jesus talks about a Pharisee who was a religious leader and a tax collector who in that culture was an outcast. Also, he spoke this parable to some, and <clears throat> notice this, who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. You see, some who trusted themselves versus trusting God. They thought they trusted God, but they really trusted themselves. And they despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. <laughs> you know, God, I know you're really glad to have me on your team. You really need me. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Mm -mm. We don't smoke and we don't chew and we don't go with girls who do. <laughs> and the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You see... <clears throat> Those men's prayers revealed who they really were. Search your heart. What does the content or the frequency of your prayer reveal about you? He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Amen.